This is a videotape film on the procedure of building an 1106B. This is the completed 1106B instrument, and these are the parts that go into building the instrument. First, we have the housing, the bead supports, the center conductor end type, the male body, the nut, the retaining ring, the inner sleeve, the connector end type, the bead connector, the male pin, the center conductor connector, the insulator connector, the center conductor housing, a capacitor, the end caps, the center support, a shim, the two resistors, the diode, the adjustment screw, the set screw, and the serial tags. In our first step of constructing the 1106B, we're going to put together the male end connector. The first part we'll pick up is our male pin. Then we'll take our bead insulator and insert the male pin in the center hole. Then we'll apply a small amount of Loctite to the male pin on the threads, being careful not to get an excess. Then we'll insert it into the center conductor connector into the threaded end and tighten very snugly. then that part is completed. We'll set it aside while we put together these three, four parts. First, we'll take the retaining ring and insert it in the grooved section of the male body with our long nose. Just slide it over. Next, we'll take a special tool, squeeze the retaining ring with this tool, and insert it in the nut with the threaded side down away from you. If it pops loose, just grab hold again. Sometimes you may have to hammer a little bit to get it to go down firmly. Next, you take the first completed prefab step and insert it in the inner sleeve, the flat side down. Then take the nut and add it tight and finger tight insert it into your vise, tighten the vise, take a 9 16 open end wrench and tighten snug.
In the next step, we're going to solder the bead supports to the housing. To do this, we use a heat gun, a holding fixture, an acid flux which we pour into a small metal dish. First of all, you take the housing and you insert it on the holding fixture, lining the two holes of the housing with the two holes of the fixture. Next, you take a 2200 0143 screw and insert it in the bottom and screw the housing to the fixture. Then you insert the fixture onto the heat gun. Turn the heat gun to high. Take a Q-tip, dip it in your flux, and wipe it around the hole in the housing. Now you wait until the flux starts smoking and bubbling as an indication that the housing is hot enough and add solder. Test with your solder when it starts smoking to see when your solder is going to flow. We don't want to overheat the housing. Now that the solder has started to flow, add a small amount, take your Q-tip dipped in acid flux again, and wipe it all around the inside of the hole. Then take your bead support, dip it in the flux, stick it in the hole, turn off your heat gun, take the screw to the holding fixture, and screw it down gently over the bead support. Turn your fixture around on the heat gun. Add some more acid flux to the hole on the other opposite side. Turn your heat gun on high again. Melt a small amount of solder in the hole wipe it around, take your other bead support, dip it in the flux, add it to the hole in the housing, turn the heat gun off, take the screw to the holding fixture, and tighten it gently also. Take the fixture off the heat gun and cool it on a heat proof surface. Next, we have the housing after we have re it has been cooled and we've removed it from the heat gun. The bead supports are soldered in. We take them and wash them with soda water and soap and a brush cleaning the surface well of the acid flux. We also check to make sure the bead support is soldered in well and the solder has flowed 
Good. Next, we take the center conductor end type and connect it to the housing. We insert it in a fixture with this screw hole to our left. We tin the wires of the bead support the inside ones first making sure the solder flows on these wires and on the outside one nearest you. Leaving a small ball of solder on the end of this wire. Then you take your N-type conductor, take some Kester 44 flux and touch it to the part and around the end. Insert it in your fixture onto the wire of the bead support. Solder that to the housing without an excess amount of solder. Remove it from the fixture. Take your long nose and give it a good pull to make sure that the solder flow is good, that you don't have a cold joint. Next, you take these little gold conductors and insert them to the wires of the bead supports in the center of the housing, pressing them snug against the bead support. The distance between these two conductors is important, so we have a device for measuring. We take the narrow end and insert it in the center. If it does not slide down, then you have to remove one of the conductors and file off some of the excess with a small file. After you've filed a small amount, insert it back on the wire of the bead support and remeasure. Still a little snug, so remove a little more. You don't want to file off too much so you get too wide of a gap because you'll have problems later. Put it back on the wire. That 
it's just about right. Take your Q-tip, dabbed and kissed your 44 flux, and put a very small amount on each gold conductor. And solder them in using your Q-tip as a brace to hold the conductor from moving. Then take your long nose and pull on each conductor to make sure that it is soldered in well. Next, take your X-Acto knife and clean off all the excess flux. and clean well with acetone. You want to remove all of the flux. Then you take this end connector and this Teflon bead and insert it in the center, pressing it all the way flush with the connector. Then you insert it on the female pin. Then you take the male connector, tighten the center conductor just a tiny amount so it'll slide snug over the pin. Insert it on the end, the bead support pin very gently. You don't want to bend that pin. Then you take four screws, 2200-0143, and attach these pieces to the housing.
you take your ceramic capacitor and add it to underneath the center conductor on the side of the female connector. You will notice that one side is grooved deeper than the other to exactly match the grooves of the center conductor. Match up the grooves. Be very careful while inserting this because it is ceramic and it will break very easily. Then you take your set screw and add it to the hole on the underside of the housing, being very careful not to strip the screw. It is a nylon locking screw and it will strip easily. Expose the head about one thread above the housing. Then you take your X-Acto knife and scrape around the inside of the screw. cleaning off any residue that may be on the screw head. Then you spray the inside with degreaser. Next, you're going to coat your diode with mercury. Here is your diode. It's very small. You take your mercury, which is a very dangerous substance, and you use it very cautiously, not getting, trying not to get it any on you at all. And when you're through with it, always return what's left over to the bottle. Take out two small beads, which you won't be able to see because they're very, very tiny. You only want to put a very small amount on this diode. You hold the diode in your tweezers, add the mercury. And gently cover the diode with mercury, gently scratching the top of the diode with your X-Acto knife, very carefully. Then you take the other piece of mercury and do the same to the other side. Then you look and you will notice that the diode has a small white dot. This white dot goes down on the set screw.
and you place it on top of the set screw in between the grooves. Next, we'll assemble the resistor assembly. You take two resistors, a 47 ohm and a 50 ohm, which has been marked with a small dot of paint to identify the difference in the two, two end caps and a center support, and liquid solder. You take your liquid solder and mix it very thoroughly. Next, you take a toothpick and put a small amount of the solder on the end of the toothpick. You very carefully spread this over the top of your resistor, being careful not to run it into the center hole of the resistor. Then you take your end caps and you will notice that one side is cut out to th that center hole fits into the cut out part of the resistor. Then you solder the end caps to the resistor, holding on to them with a fixture. Be very careful not to leave your iron on too long. Once it starts smoking, let it smoke for about a second, then remove your iron. Then you turn the resistors over and you spread the liquid solder around the rim on the other side. Then you take your center support and place it on top one of the resistors. Then you take your other resistor and place it on top. Next you place it in a fixture. After placing the resistor in the fixture, you solder the two resistors to the center support.
taking your iron away immediately after the solder has flown. You remove it from the fixture. Next, we're going to take the completed resistor assembly and solder on, weld on a fine piece of gold wire from the center support to the end cap of the 50 ohm resistor. First of all, you set the resistor in the jaws of the spot welder. Pick up your gold wire with the tweezers, set it on the center support, and gently press the bar of your welder. You catch the end of the gold wire and gently pull it off. This will help you to, f to find whether you have a good weld or not. When you remove it from the jaws, set the end of the resistor, the end cap, in the jaws. Bring the gold wire over and again gently press the bar. Remove, gently remove the gold wire. This again will tell whether the weld has taken or not. And remove the resistor assembly from the jaws. In our final step before test, we're going to insert the resistor assembly into the housing using a shim for which we have nine different sizes to ensure that the resistor is in the housing very snugly and doesn't move around. First of all, you pick up your resistor and you put it in the housing with the 50 ohm side next to the side with the capacitor, the conductor with the capacitor. Then you take your shim and slide it in between the conductor and the resistor. making sure the resistor is very snug in between the two conductors. Now that the assembly procedure is finished, we will do the test procedure. Uh, the 1106 has two uh, types, uh, the 1106B option one and the 1106B. Each are tested with separate test gear, so I will go th through the block diagram. Um, the uh, 1105, 1106 combination is a relaxation oscillator which drives the 1106. Uh, it then goes into a uh, sampling head, uh, which in the case of the option one is the 1430A and then into the uh, actual sampling oscilloscope, which is made up of two plug engines, the 1411 and 1425. The uh, option one takes a 1430A head, and the reason is is because the connectors that on the option one are of APC type, and the connectors on the 1430A are also a APC type. The 1106B t has N-type connectors, and it also interfaces best with the 1430C, which has N-type connectors. There are slight uh, modifications in the uh, uh, spe specifications for the 1106B option one and the 1106B uh, standard. The 1106B option one has an overshoot spec of 4% and an undershoot spec of 4% and a rise time of 30 picoseconds. 
with the 1430A sampling head. The 1106B has an overshoot spec of 6% and an undershoot spec of 6% and a rise time of 28 picoseconds using the 1430C. Uh, the trigger line that we see here is generated from the uh, 140 uh, oscilloscope and goes to the 1105. Next, we have the testing of the 1106B. First of all, we attach the unit to the 1430C. Connect it with the 1105. and use the sensitivity to trigger. Moving the trays on screen with the vertical position. Next, using the vernier knob, you expand it to full screen of the graticule. perhaps having to move the trays on screen with the horizontal position. You bring this down with the time per centimeter knob set at 10 to the center of your screen to measure the droop, which is the first check. The maximum droop can be 2% per division. Move this across the screen with the horizontal position knob next with the vertical position knob bring the trays back to the center Turning the time per centimeter knob in the center, move the red knob to point zero, 0,1. With the vernier knob, move the traces a little above and a little below two lines. Then turn to expanded position to measure your rise time. The rise time should be 28 picoseconds. You measure from the knee each square representing 10. You count 10, 20, up to 28. This is a little fast, and occasionally you have to make adjustments to make a better trace on screen. Next, you return to normal, take the veneer, back down to include the trace right on the two, the bottom and top line. Bringing this to the center of the graticule, turn your knob to point one of a time per centimeter to measure perturbations. Turn, switch the switch to expanded. Find the center of your baseline. 
Your perturbation should read no more than 6% of a 10 centimeter division of the graticule. Moving across, you have 4, 2, 4, and almost zero. This is a representation of undershoot. To adjust undershoot, you take an adjustment screw and insert it in the side of the housing. Watching the screen as you insert the screw, you will add capacitance to the resistor and soon you will see the leading edge move up from the baseline to increase the undershoot to overshoot of approximately 4% and also undershoot of approximately 4%. To demonstrate overshoot, I will bring the screw in closer to add more capacitance to the resistor and you will see the leading edge rising even higher. To re reduce overshoot in a situation where there has been no adjustment screw put in, you take your Allen driver, insert it in the bottom of the unit, raise, turning the diode screw to raise the resistor, thus reducing the capacitance between the two conductors in the center, which will reduce overshoot in some cases. If this is not true, then you remove the resistor and insert a new resistor, putting that resistor aside for possible later use. Next, after test, we glue in the resistor assembly. First of all, we use a centigram scale to measure the epoxy. You set the scale at two centigrams and measure the Echobon epoxy into a, an aluminum dish. Then you take the scale and set it at point four centigrams and measure the liquid. You mix this very thoroughly. If this needs thinning, you can add up to 0.3 grams of toluene to thin down your epoxy. After the epoxy has been thoroughly mixed, you take a toothpick and add the epoxy to the end cap of the resistor and the gold capacitor. Using a very small amount, getting the epoxy all around the resistor and the conductor. You do this to both ends.
After this has been completed, the unit is ready to be put on heat run. The heat run fixture number is ET5104. You add the unit, turn the black knob all the way to the right and run for 24 hours. This will run the unit in normal operating, under normal operating conditions. After the unit has been heat run for 24 hours, you have it TDR'd, you retest it, and then it is ready to be buttoned up. To button up the unit, you first take permabond, dip a Q-tip in it, and dab a small amount between the housing and the capacitor. Next, you take a small amount of Loctite and add it to the adjustment screw. Then you take your cover and add four screws, 2220-0010 to the four screw holes on top of the cover. Tighten these down. Then you take four more screws, 2200-0143, and add to the sides. Then you're ready to add your serial tags. You activate the glue on your printed serial tag by dipping the Q-tip in TCE and spreading it over the back of your tag. You add the tag so that the printed numbers are going down towards the female connector. You add it to your vise and press it on. Then you add your caution tag. Which is already taped on with the caution maximum input 1 volt pointing up towards the male connector. You press this on 
also with the vise. After this has been completed, the unit is ready to be shipped and 